Shin Asuka was a normal boy until tragedy. Now he's got a chip on his shoulder and a pine cone up his ass, which means he's really, really pissed. This isn't over! Once more, war will rage across the stars between a man with cool hair and a man with purple lipstick. Now, Chairman Durendal, I shall play a requiem for you and all your kind! There's nukes and, like, eight big lasers. It, it, it's actually not very good. You, you probably don't want to watch this one. Airing tonight on Toonami, but only if it's 2007. Mobile Suit Gundam Seed Destiny. Will you survive? <clears throat> Alright, I'm done. Where's my paycheck? When I previously reviewed Gundam Seed, I found that despite it having some flaws, it was a serviceable, if not enjoyable, entry into the Gundam franchise. Perhaps most importantly, Gundam Seed was very accessible to new audiences. Not since Gundam Wing had the franchise found broad enough appeal to really call a series a true hit, but Gundam Seed would see a lot of success. It required no previous viewing of the long and storied property, took what worked from the original Universal Century and mashed it together with a bunch of young adult drama and romance to bring in new audiences. It should be no surprise then that Gundam Seed would spawn its own sequel, though unlike with previous alternate timelines, Sunrise would go whole hog into a full 50 episode sequel anime. Yep, that's right, a whole new adventure awaited fans of Kira and Athran, no endless waltz style theatrical follow-up or four episode OVA special. No matter what your feelings for Gundam Seed, Gundam Seed Destiny had enormous shoes to fill. I mean, not only did it reprise its role in Gundam Seed's TV time slot, it aired right after Full Metal Alchemist ended, and as far as ratings goes, Destiny actually did pretty well. It didn't surpass its father show or Full Metal Alchemist for that matter, but it would actually go on to sell more on DVD. While it would seem that Seed Destiny was set up for a resounding success, it unfortunately has become known in the Gundam fandom as a tremendous failure in the realms of tone, character writing, and heart. While I did have this in mind during my viewing of Destiny, I try to go into every show with an optimistic outlook. Even ones that don't wholly appeal to me, such as Gundam Wing, have things about them that are unique and make them watchable all on their own. Have parts that are wholly unique and make the show enjoyable. I mean, can you get more of a 90s vibe than Gundam Wing? But unfortunately, I have to say that Seed Destiny is the first Gundam show that I really think is just plain bad. Now, sure, there are some things about it that are watchable. Nothing that borrows from Zeta Gundam can be 100% terrible after all. But this might be the first show that, if I had been watching without the intent to make a video, I might have just dropped it. Mostly, it just feels like the writing staff for Seed Destiny didn't really have any more ideas for the setting, and even beyond that, the new things that they did try, such as main protagonist Shin Asuka, they sort of gave up halfway through in favor of bringing back the old favorites. This causes so many headaches, like Athrun having a negative character arc so that he and Kira can fight, and Shin acting like Episode 1 Camille, but forever. This goes hand in hand with the problem that Destiny is a little too on the nose with its fan service. And yes, I do mean in both a big titties up in your face way, which happens way more in Destiny than it ever did in OG Seed, and also in the let's just cram Zaku in here because way. 
So without further bitching on my part, let's get into Mobile Suit Gundam Seed Destiny and find out if there might be a diamond lurking underneath all that... shin. Now I will say that I really do think that Gundam Seed Destiny has a very strong opening. We're introduced to new series protagonist Shin Asuka during the Battle of Orb from the previous series. Shin and his family try to flee the massive destruction caused by the fighting, but due to being just too close to the fight between Kira and Izak, they are caught in an explosion and Shin's entire family is killed right in front of him. By Gundam Seed standards, it's actually quite graphic, and the imagery of Shin's sister's severed arm is hard to get out of your head. Though it's definitely harder to get the image out of Shin's head, as this becomes his driving motivation for the entire show. And honestly, that's totally fine, and a great motivation for Shin's arc, if he had one. More on that later. The story truly starts two years after the Bloody Valentine War depicted in Gundam Seed. Zaft and the Earth Alliance have been existing within an uneasy treaty since the ending of the last show, and while this means that the last two years have been a time of peace, while the audience kind of gets the feeling that the Earth Sphere is a powder keg waiting to erupt. Kigali, who is now the leader of Orb, and Athran, going under the name Alex Dino, are currently visiting the newly built L4 colony Armory. Kigali is here to talk with the new chairman of Zaft, Gilbert Durandal, a man with hair too cool to not be evil, and yes, Durandal was not in the original Gundam Seed, and he kinda comes totally out of nowhere. And yeah, I know that the Astray manga fills in some of the holes between Seed and Destiny, but I haven't read them and I figure that back in the day when this was airing, most people probably hadn't either, so that's where I'm coming from on that front. Unfortunately, Kigali is unable to attend her very important meeting as the Armory 1 station is attacked by a trio of weirdos that steal three top-of-the-line Gundam mobile suits. They attack the hangars to cover their retreat, and we get a good look at some of the new suit designs. Much like in the original Gundam Seed, Destiny has a pretty good variety of mecha designs, and this is shown off really well with the Chaos, Abyss, and Gaia Gundams. But then, the cosmic era of Gundam has always had very strong mobile suit design. These three, known from here on out as Phantom Pain, are led by the series Sharklone, a mysterious masked figure known only as Neo Roanoke. During the attack, Athrin and Kigali are able to board a Zaft Zaku. Athrin is still good enough to fend off two Gundams until he's saved by the arrival of Shin Asuka and the Impulse Gundam. Despite my feelings on Shin as a whole, the Impulse is undeniably cool and uses a similar core block system to the original RX-78 II, or even the Victory Gundam. However, I do want to point out that Seed Destiny does do the same thing that I hated from Victory, where in every episode they always launch the mobile suit in separate pieces and then they have to like assemble it mid-fight. But at least in Victory they tried to incorporate that into the show's story, at least somewhat. Here it really feels like they did it just to waste a minute of animation. And then when you combine that on top of all of the reused animation that Destiny is constantly throwing at you, it just starts to get really aggravating. This wouldn't be a Gundam show without a ship for the main cast to putt around in in space. You might be surprised that Destiny opts to not dredge up the Archangel for a return tour, yet anyway, and we're introduced to the top of the line Zaft mobile suit carrier, the Minerva. Helmed by Zaft captain Talia Gladys, the Minerva takes on Chairman Durandal along with Kigali and Athrin to pursue the fleeing Thebes. During this opening arc, we're also introduced to fellow Zaft pilot, Ray Zaburl, who is shown having a new type flash early on, and also has long blonde hair, which by the rules of Gundam Seed, means he's definitely gonna be evil later. Along with Ray and Shin is Luna Maria Hawk, another pilot who serves to mostly present the audience with 
both types of fan service. She's kind of like a flay light. She spends the first half trying to cozy up to Athrin, though she's way less sinister and annoying than the last redheaded woman we have. And I don't bring up the hair color flippantly. Both Luna and her sister Marin, who serves as a bridge officer in the Minerva, look incredibly similar to Flay. Especially when Marin wears her hair down, I can't imagine that was by accident. There are a few other characters aboard the Minerva, but they really don't stand out too much. There's this kid with what appears to be level 1 Yu-Gi-Oh hair who works as a mechanic, but honestly he does nothing and I don't remember his name. And then there's Arthur, the first officer, whose most standout quality is that he has a British accent in the dub. Oh, and also he's a Locus fanboy, which is kind of adorable. While chasing after these stolen mobile suits, Chairman Durandal finds out that Kigali and Athrin have stowed away on board the ship, and he takes this opportunity to show them the brand new Impulse and Zaku mobile suits. Kigali asks him if it's really a good idea to be developing new weapons, right after the world went through an incredibly destructive war, and his response to her point is basically, well, yeah, but anyway. Kigali's day gets even worse after this because she comes face to face with Shin, the kid whose entire family was killed during the Battle of Orb, and current pilot of the Impulse Gundam. You see, Shin blames Orb and the Atha family for the death of his family. Shin hates Kigali on a deeply personal level, to the point where he just openly refers to her as a bitch in front of Athrin later on. And this misplaced hatred of the ruling sect of the country of Orb becomes a thing that pushes Shin to make terrible decisions in the future, and also makes him incredibly resistant to any change or even introspection. I want to go more in depth on Shin's character later because boy did I end up hating him. And it's a shame because out of everything in Sea Destiny, uh, Shin Asuka probably has the most squandered potential of all. So we have our setup with the Zaft Carrier Minerva chasing a group of mysterious thieves who just made off with three top of the line mobile suits. Pretty similar opening to the first series I must say, but then Gundam Seed Destiny will go to tread on a lot of the same ground as the first. Eventually, both ships enter a huge debris field full of asteroids and other junk. Rei and his signature White Zaku Warrior, otherwise known as White Baldy by Neo. And really, man, you couldn't come up with anything else other than, haha, your mobile suit is bald. Is it ironic that both pilots have flowing golden locks of hair? The Minerva falls into a trap set by the Fleeing Alliance craft and is buried in a bunch of rubble, until Athrin suggests they blow themselves out of it. Once they're free, the bridge crew observes the abandoned and destroyed colony Junius 7 moving out of its orbit. Now, this is a big deal because Junius 7 was ground zero for a terror attack that sparked the last war, and it was purposely left in orbit as a memorial to all those who lost their lives. It moving out of orbit and falling to the Earth would be, um, incredibly bad, especially since it's caused by a bunch of terrorists that are still loyal to Athrin's dead father, the former chairman Patrick Zala. They strap a bunch of engines onto the former colony and send it hurtling towards the Earth, Everyone, including the current Zaft leadership, is freaking out, and this leads Athrin to finally get off his ass and pilot a mobile suit under his real name. The Alliance leadership seems much less concerned about it, though, and the current leader of the terrorist cell Blue Cosmos, a very fancy man named Lord Jabril, believes that a literal apocalyptic event is just what he needs to help him seize power after it's all over. So, not a great guy, first of all, and honestly kind of a weaker stand-in for the former leader of Blue Cosmos, Asriel. The stolen Gundams operated by Alliance Spec Ops Phantom Pain Unit also shows up at Junius 7, although they believe the Minerva to be the ones who are causing it to fall to Earth. A battle ensues because of the confusion, and in that time no one is able to stop the colony from being pulled into Earth's orbit. Despite Izak's team being able to crack Junius 7 into multiple pieces, the sections that fall to Earth are still large enough to cause major damage. This event isn't referred to as the Break the World incident for no reason. This episode ends with Kira staring at the falling colony on the horizon. Honestly, a visual that I really like, as there is some great art in this show. 
While Chairman Durandal offers support and heads relief efforts towards the Earth, Blue Cosmos discovers that a group of coordinators were behind the disaster. Atherin and Kigali arrive back in Orb because the Minerva was basically acting as their personal Uber, much to Shin's disdain. While Kigali is whisked away to administration meetings, Atherin drives his cool sports car around and thinks about how he doesn't know what to do with his life. He ends up talking to Kira about the whole incident and makes the decision to return to the plants and talk to Chairman Durandal, mostly because he decides that that's better than sitting around and doing nothing. You can say what you want about the ending of Gundam Seed, but at least I found it to be pretty hopeful. So to think that afterwards one of our main characters just drifts around unhappily is kind of depressing. Yeah, it can be done really well in a show like Megalobox, but here in Gundam Seed Destiny, it just kind of causes all of Atherin's character development from Seed to be undone and that gets very frustrating. Before leaving for space, Atherin gives Kigali a ring, so if there was any question about their relationship, there sure isn't now. Even more frustrating to me is Shin's development, which has its moments throughout the show, but never really goes anywhere. Not only that, but while I find Shin's tragic backstory a fine motivation, I also find the constant flashbacks to his sister exploding overdone and annoying. You can bet every time Shin looks at that cell phone, he's going to have a 30 second flashback over her grisly demise, at least. Shin meets the former main character along the shore of Orb. They spend a second staring at the memorial, and initially, I think this was meant to be a passing of the torch moment, but that would unfortunately be very wrong. Thinking that Zaft is once again up to their old tricks, the Earth Alliance makes an announcement with a list of demands that are totally ridiculous. They would basically make the plants an NX state with no autonomy, and the alternative is war. While the Zaft Council frantically discusses what to do, Jabril decides that no matter what Zaft says, he's gonna blow up the colonies and bring about a new world order. Yeah, Jabril is a rather simple villain with quite simple plans, and it doesn't take long for the Alliance fleet to show up at the plants. And I mean, they aren't playing around, they just fire a bunch of nukes at them. Luckily, Zaft has a giant gun called the Neutron Stampeder that shoots a big energy wave that takes out all the nukes, and then it's never mentioned again. After this, the battle comes to a standstill and the Alliance forces retreat back to their base on the moon. And you would think that this attempted genocide of the entire coordinator population would be a bigger deal for the entirety of the show, but it just sort of isn't. This whole event barely even gets mentioned for the rest of the series, which becomes very frustrating as parts of the cast will constantly wonder who the bad guys really are. And while yes, eventually the suspicion that Durandal is the big bad guy behind everything is proven correct, it's just written in a way that's incredibly aggravating. None of the reasons that the main cast thinks that Durandal is the greater of two evils comes anywhere close to firing hundreds of nukes at a bunch of civilians, so it just makes everyone come across as either stupid or way too far up their own ass. One of the first hints that we get that uh, Durandal might not be all chocolate chips and rainbows is when Atherin finally arrives at the plant's capital and is met by Lacus in a very revealing outfit, which is strange because we just saw her back at Orb hanging out in an orphanage, and it doesn't take Atherin long to figure out that she's a body double. So yeah, Durandal is having a woman named Mir Campbell pretend to be Lacus Klein so that he can use her to produce propaganda. Not exactly a very ethical thing to do, but on a scale of zero to launching nukes at millions of people, I'd say it rates closer to zero. The fake Lacus takes Atherin to dinner and then asks him a bunch of questions about the pink haired songstress, thinking that they're still engaged. Atherin isn't in a very talkative mood, however, as Chairman Durandal had just taken him to see the brand new Savior Gundam and given him an offer that he's finding very hard to refuse. Back on Earth, we get introduced to a guy named Yuna Seiren, a creepy pretty boy who serves as a representative of Orb. He is really gross, actually, and is constantly invading Kigali's personal space. When Kigali doesn't want to enter the treaty with the Alliance, Yuna tells her that she's too emotional and they can't trust her judgment. 
And then if you didn't hate him enough, we find out that Kigali and Yuna are actually part of an arranged engagement that was approved by their fathers. And Yuna takes this arrangement as a law. He even proposes officially to Kigali at the end of the episode. All of this lines up with Zaft officially sending in landing forces in response to the Alliance's demands. Athrin is given his red uniform once again, but this time he wears a special insignia, marking him as a member of Faith, a special operations group that only reports to the Zaft Council. He's basically a Spectre from Mass Effect, but this came out first, so good move Gundam Seed. The Minerva decides that it's time to get the hell out of Dodge, and it quietly leaves Orb, only to be met with a Federation fleet. This battle at least lets Shin distinguish himself as he accesses the Seed Mode Berserker state and blows up six Alliance ships. We cut back to Kigali and Yuna, and I think this part of the show best exemplifies how they just sort of took everyone's story arc and undid it. Kigali's entire story arc in Seed was about her learning to stop fighting on the battlefield in a mobile suit and become a strong leader. She went from an angry youth who lashed out at the obvious enemy in an effort to make a difference to actually making a difference as a strong leader of a strong country. Now I had my criticism of Kigali in Seed and I don't think that she should have piloted a mobile suit after the halfway point, but damn, they really just nerfed her here. Yuna imposes this marriage on her and she just goes along with it. He even tells her she's not allowed to be around Kira or Athrun, and she just sends Kira a message with Athrun's ring asking him to take care of it and return it to him. It's weak as hell and a total backslide from how she was at the end of Seed. Speaking of Kira, well, he and the rest of his group, which includes Ramius and Waldfeld, have moved from an orphanage to a big mansion on a private island. Nice digs, Kira. Well, it would be nice if it weren't for the terror attack. Coordinator Special Forces soldiers show up in an attempt to kill Lachis. They even stab Waldfelt in the arm, which gives us the reveal that his prosthetic arm is also a gun now, which is dumb, but it's also cool, so I'll allow it. Even after the group fights off all of these soldiers, they just bombard the mansion from afar with their amphibious mobile suits. Kira decides that now is the time to climb back into the cockpit and reveals that the Freedom Gundam was buried in the mansion's basement the whole time. Unfortunately, the soldiers don't want to be taken alive and they blow themselves up. The next morning, Kira talks to his mom and I can't help but wonder what happened to his dad. Not the crazy scientist Dr. Habiki, but the guy that acted as his adoptive father. I mean, he was alive the last time we saw him in Seed. I guess he went to get milk and didn't come back. Kira takes the Freedom and everyone boards the Archangel, the old ship from Seed. They zoom on over to Kigali's wedding and Kira just kidnaps her right off the altar. And I think this right here just sums up everything that went wrong with Gundam Seed Destiny. Kigali literally is reduced to a damsel in distress. Athrin is back working for Zaft in a red uniform and our new characters are just watching. The way I understand it, there was originally a real plan for Seed Destiny and the brand new characters. However, due to disputes among the writing staff and Kira placing above Shin on a character poll, a ton of changes were made and the old cast were brought back. Now these reasons are often repeated online and I'm not totally sure if they're the true reason for all the changes, but whatever they were reduced Destiny to a pretty basic retread of the original show. Maybe if Kira was kept as nothing more of a cameo and Athrun served a mentor role towards Shin as the main character, things would have turned out different, but this is pretty much what we got. So here we are with Kira having been a bad enough dude to kidnap the president and then call her stupid, and Athrun returning to Orb only to have them shoot at him. Being confused at that, he proceeds to the Zaft base at Carpentaria and links up with the Minerva. Captain Talia is also a member of Faith, which means that she and Athrun basically share a rank and she can't really order him to do anything. Fortunately, Athrun isn't dumb, so when it comes time to defend the ship, he leads the charge. This next arc mostly focuses on Athrun's time aboard the Minerva while piloting the Savior Gundam. 
The Minerva is ordered across the Indian Ocean, and eventually they arrive at Mahamul Base. The Alliance has taken the Suez Canal, and the land between there and the base is crawling with rebel factions that are fighting back against the Alliance's power grab. The Minerva assists in an operation to take out an Alliance Positron cannon mounted on, well, a mountain which goes pretty well with Shin being able to sneak up on the position and take it out. This victory is undercut with the citizens of the nearby town lining up all the Alliance soldiers and executing them, which Athrin finds distasteful. The Minerva leaves Suez and crosses the Black Sea to arrive in a city called Diokuia, where the fake Lacus is putting on a concert for the troops. We see Arthur geek out over her and it's actually adorable. The pilots aboard the Minerva and Talia meet with Durandal under the guise of a celebration of their efforts in the offensive. Durandal goes on about how the root of war is that people are greedy and they profit from it, so they stoke people's differences in order to sell weapons. It's honestly a pretty simple concept, but Shin seems shocked by this revelation, so surprise! Chairman Durandal refers to this shadowy cabal as Logos, and while at first I thought Gundam Seed was about to get really philosophical on me, uh, no, Logos is actually a group of greedy old men. Well, I can't disagree with Durandal's logic, so the show has to start placing ominous cuts of him staring at a chessboard so that I know he's evil. Thanks, that uh, clears that up. Athrin wakes up next to the fake Lacus and has no idea how she got in his room. I guess she broke in and slept next to him in the middle of the night, which is insane psycho behavior and Mir's explanation of Haha, I'm Lacus doesn't really dispute that theory. Athrin brushes it off as really weird and is introduced to another member of Faith named Hein Westenfluss. Hein is also a side to the Minerva, and he pretty much just serves as a way for the show to question Athrin's way of doing things, and in turn to make Athrin question himself. If you thought Athrin being wishy-washy about everything and unsure of himself was bad before, well, now it gets even worse. Shin drives around on a cool motorcycle, and instead of keeping his eyes on the road like a responsible motorist, he thinks about his sister's explosive death, and then he has a full flashback to a conversation from one episode ago. Yeah, this becomes a huge problem in Seed Destiny specifically. I mean, we just saw this episode, do we need an entire conversation repeated again? And this only gets worse as the series goes on. Paired with the over-reliance of flashbacks to Seed, I'm assuming as a way to cut back on animation cost, there are points of destiny that just feel like they're going nowhere. While Shin is driving around, he spies the phantom pain pilot Stella haphazardly dancing on a sheer cliff face. How'd she get out here? I guess she walked. I don't, I don't know. She doesn't have shoes on. Unsurprisingly, Stella falls into the ocean, and Shin has to dive into the waves below to save her, after she almost claws his face off, that is. Now, of course, Shin doesn't know that she's an Alliance pilot at this point, and I think he just assumes that something is wrong with her, because Stella is a total weirdo. The other Phantom Pain pilots can hold full conversations and seem fairly normal, but Stella is either having full-on panic attacks or is so scatterbrained that she seems like a five-year-old. And it's for this reason that the fan service with her kinda grosses me out. Luckily, it's only in this episode, but having this character who acts like someone who can't really make decisions for themselves flash their uh, assets everywhere just seems like it's in poor taste. Having no way to scale the cliffs, Shin uses an emergency beacon and has Athrin come and save him. The god of coincidence must be looking down on them too, as the other members of Phantom Pain just happen to be driving by at the time and are able to pick Stella up. Stella gives Shin a rock or a piece of broken glass or something to remember her by. I never really knew what it was, but it makes me laugh to think that it's just like some garbage that she found. In an inevitable confrontation, Athrin learns that the forces of Orb are being used as a spearhead by the Alliance because of their battle power, and that they're coming to take back the Black Sea. Just as the two forces are about to fight each other, with the Minerva charging up its Positron Cannon, Kira shows up and heavily damages the ship. The Archangel isn't far behind, and they've decided that this battle shouldn't happen, and everyone just needs to chill. 
Kigali thinks that she's the ace in the Archangel's hole, so she launches in the Strike Rouge and announces that she is Kigali Atha, the ruler of Orb. She then tells the Orb forces to stand down, but predictably Yuna is a self-serving douchebag and says the person in the suit must be lying, so he attacks anyway. Here's where Hein launches in a bright orange goof, which is cool to see, though I could have done without him saying the this is no Zaku throwback line. Uh, he gets cut in half by Stella here and dies. Thanks for being in like three episodes, I guess. This death gives Athrun a flimsy motivation for being enemies with Kira once more. He tries to hail him on the radio during the battle, but Kira just doesn't receive the message or doesn't answer, which is annoying because later on they directly radio into enemy cockpits with no explanation and no problems. Athrun blames Kira and the Archangel for introducing chaos onto the battlefield, and he explicitly blames Kira for Hein's death, which I think is really dumb. Hein was already engaged with Stella for a while before Kira showed up. If he got distracted and let Stella get behind him, then that's his fault. But much like Athrun's motivation for everything in Seed Destiny, it's flimsy and doesn't hold up to much scrutiny. Because of the freedom and Archangel's intervention, both sides fight to a standstill and then retreat. Athrin leaves the Minerva in order to search for Kira and the Archangel on his own, though Talia sends Luna to spy on him just in case. I have to say, the way he tracks them down is just a big ass pull. Athrin literally happens to just drive past Miriolia from Seed, who's working as a freelance reporter, and she just happens to be able to, like, contact the Archangel on the phone? I do wonder what in the world Athrin planned to do if he didn't just come across someone who could contact exactly who he needed to at exactly the right time. When Athrin finally meets Kira once again, along with Kigali, he just blames them for being in the way, saying people died because of his intervention. Yes, Athrin, surely no one would have died in that big battle he would have had otherwise. He basically tells Kira just to go back into hiding while he goes to fight a war, and has even less to say to Kigali, who he was supposed to be in a relationship with, but would rather run from. Kira does let Athrun know about the attack on Lacus' life before he goes. Food for thought, I guess. Happening at the same time as Athrun's search mission, Ray and Shin go to check out an abandoned Alliance laboratory. They find that it was a research center that the Alliance have been using to experiment on children to create the biological CPUs. Upon seeing this, Ray freaks the hell out and has to be taken back to the Minerva to recover. Zaft forces secure the lab and discover that bombs had been set but not detonated and they're able to recover a ton of information. Learning about the Alliance's work on the boosted men of Gundam Seed and the new members of Phantom Pain, known as the Extended. These improved humans are the Alliance's attempt to be able to fight on the level of the Coordinators, which is pretty hypocritical until you see that they don't even think of these kids as people. The boosted men were so unstable they could barely communicate outside of battle, but the Extended are much, much more sociable and easier to control. They achieve this by literally wiping the extended memories in these pods, but I guess that's better than remembering having to take part in a drug-fueled battle royale as a 10-year-old. It would seem that the memory wiping isn't foolproof, however, as Stella starts getting some horrifying memories back and flees the Alliance ship in an attempt to destroy the lab before Zaft can learn too much. She runs into Shin and Rei and can't stand up to them, ending up captured after they take out the Gaia Gundam. And here's where Shin gets ultra annoying as he dotes over her in the med bay even though she doesn't remember him, or the broken rock that he still has. Other bad news is that the doctor aboard the Minerva learns that Stella's body requires a cocktail of hardcore drugs to function, and she's basically dying. Also, everybody gets really, really mad at Shin for bringing her back to the Minerva's med bay, and they tell them that it has broken a bunch of military regulations, but I don't really see how. How does capturing an enemy soldier break regulations? I guess they should have just killed her while she was defenseless. They don't have much time to focus on their new prisoner, however, as the Minerva once again enters a battle against the Orb fleet near the island of Crete. Kira and Kigali decide to interrupt the battle once again, and once again the Orb forces ignore Kigali's calls to stop fighting, but this time Shin shoots at her. 
Kira gets in a fight with both him and Athrin, though he makes short work of his former friend, and the savior Gundam is completely shredded. Shin, however, decides to attack the Orb main fleet, taking out a bunch of their ships. Just before he blows up their flagship, the leader of the Orb battle group, Captain Todaka, tells all those loyal to Kigali and her father's ideals for Orb to leave. Then he goes down with the ship, and thanks to a quick flashback, we learn that Captain Todaka was actually the one who saved Shin after his family was blown up. Honestly, this just makes me hate Shin even more as he seems to just come up with whatever self-righteous justification he wants so that he's always right. Lacus decides that she's had enough of Durandal using a creepy look-alike to fuel his war, so she steals a shuttle with the help of Waldfelt and takes off to space. Eventually, they meet up with the Eternal, the ship that Lacus helmed in the last war. It's also a little weird that Lacus just has a military faction loyal to her in space that has been building weapons for two years. Who pays them? and why she mad at Durandal for doing the same exact thing. Shin overhears Captain Talia talking about taking Stella back to HQ to have her dissected. <laughs> that line is hard to get out. So he pulls a Gundam protagonist move and steals her with the help of Rey and Luna. I, and when I say steals her, I mean it. They wheel her right out on the hospital bed. Does this ship not have any security cameras at all? Shin then takes Stella back to Neo, thinking that if he makes Neo super duper pinky promise not to make Stella fight anymore, then everything will be all good. Finally, the middle arc of Seed Destiny comes to a close, as both the Minerva and Archangel get word that the Alliance is using a huge mech called the Destroy Gundam to attack cities in Europe, seemingly at random. They both decide to stop the Alliance's charge, and we find the Freedom Gundam fighting alongside the Impulse, which is a cool flip that at least makes these episodes interesting. During the battle, Neo tells Shin that Stella is piloting the giant machine, so Shin is reluctant to fight to his full ability. This leads to Kira making a killing blow on the Destroy in order to stop it from firing its big laser gun. Of course, Shin becomes even more resentful of the Freedom Gundam after this, as he believes Kira could have stopped Stella in a way that didn't end in her death. But could he have? If Kira hadn't attacked the Destroy at that point, both he and Shin would have been killed when it fired its main gun, which is something that Shin should be able to figure out. But because it was Stella in the Destroy Gundam's cockpit, Shin cannot accept that, and this really just illustrates how Shin stays the same immature character from episode 1. Kira killing Stella and saving the rest of the civilians could have been a really good chance to make Shin come around and have some actual development, but instead he's even more angry than before. On the other side of things, having Kira strike a killing blow on Stella is kind of stupid. While Kira doesn't criticize his friends for taking life during battle, he has a pretty rock solid no kill policy since the halfway point in Seed. Even when he does take a life, it's this big moment. He's shown feeling really terrible about it, but here he just like kills Stella with no remorse. It's weird and it kind of makes me feel like the writers just didn't know what to do with his character. Captain Ramius discovers the body of Neo in the rubble of Berlin, and don don don, it's Mula Flaga. How did he survive the explosion of the strike at the end of Seed? Is he another clone? Who knows? Who cares? The crew takes him to the med bay aboard the Archangel, where he will spend the majority of the remainder of Seed Destiny. Shin also finds Stella in the rubble, and then she tells Shin that she loves him and dies. This was perhaps the most half-assed romance that I've ever seen in a Gundam show. These two barely spend any time together, and when they do, Stella is pretty much comatose or experiencing a full-on mental breakdown. So if Shin fell in love with her through that, he is a better man than I. Shin then goes and deposits Stella's body into a frozen lake to keep it fresh for later. I don't... I don't know where I was going with that joke, I don't know. Durandal and his coordinator video editors edit the Freedom Gundam out of the footage from Berlin, making it appear that it was Shin who defeated it. Athrin thinks this is weird, and along with the growing feeling that everything isn't quite right with the chairman, starts to actually question what he and the Minerva are doing. Durandal puts out a message where he outs a bunch of billionaires as the backers of Blue Cosmos and the Alliance, saying that there will always be a war as long as these people exist. 
He even gives their group a name, Logos, which is not only a philosophical moniker that hits the nail right on the head, but is also just a really good plan, honestly. What better way to get a bunch of followers to fight a common enemy than to give them a face and a name? And to Durandal's credit, he's pretty much right. It's not like these rich old assholes are scapegoats. This could have been an opportunity to show that anyone can fall for propaganda, even if you have good intentions, and in a way it does do that, just not very well. The main crew hem and haw about how people rise up into rebel factions and start attacking and killing members of Logos around the globe. Even though they don't offer an alternative, I think that the last thing that you want your characters to fight for in a story like Gundam is the status quo. And at the moment, that's really just what it feels like. Kira and the rest of the Archangel can monologue about how it isn't the right thing to do, but at the end of the day, they don't have a concrete goal or even an idea of what they want to do, besides the nebulous overarching theme of stopping the Alliance and Zaft from fighting. Which is all well and good, but you can't have your villain be the one attempting to address injustice and expect me not to side with them at least a little bit. Especially when the main characters had years to try and fix things as incredibly influential people, <clears throat> Lacus, but decides to run an orphanage instead. I felt as though a big theme in Seed was that the world wouldn't just fix itself, it needed actual people driving change. So it's weird to find out that our characters just did nothing to achieve that until destiny started. Durandal has to do something evil before the audience begins to question who the antagonist really is, so he orders the Minerva to begin Operation Angel Down. No, that's not a Gerard Butler movie. They move out to attack the Archangel and blow the ship up once and for all, though Athrin continually asks why they are fighting the Archangel. Both Shin and Rey figure out that Kira won't aim at the cockpit, and they can use this to their advantage. The fight between the two ships and the Impulse and Freedom Gundams is actually pretty cool. There are some good moments like Shin throwing his shield to deflect a beam. Ultimately, Shin gets close enough to Kira that he can impale the Freedom and throw it into the ocean. Of course, the suit explodes, and the show really, really wants you to think that Kira's dead, but hey, they've pulled this one before. Kira does somehow escape the suit and survives the explosion and is brought back aboard the Archangel. The ship is able to escape the Minerva by just going underwater and detonating a bomb to make them think that the ship exploded. Which sounds like an obvious plan, but it works. Kira wakes up in the med bay right next to Neo, who's been recovering and captive aboard the Archangel. I do find it interesting that he never once tries to escape, though the ship is usually underwater, so I guess there would be nowhere to go. I think you were supposed to assume that Neo was having second thoughts about the Alliance, knowing that they erased the memories of the Phantom Pain members all the time. Why wouldn't they be able to do it to him? However, this isn't portrayed very well. He has a few conversations with Ramius, but mostly he just kind of sits there. Athrin is super pissed off at Shin and Rei, wondering why they had to kill Kira. I feel like the answer is obvious, Athrin. You just had an entire monologue at Kira about how you were a soldier. Athrin and Shin are taken by Durandal and shown the Destiny and Legend Gundams, which are brand new generation machines that the chairman wants the two to pilot. He tells them that they'll help him create a new world without war, and combined with the Shin killing Kira and the apparent loss of the Archangel, Athrin finally comes around. Durandal tells him directly that if Kira had just been a soldier like he was supposed to, then he'd still be alive, and this is direct foreshadowing for the chairman's final plan. Ray and Durandal have a conversation that is overheard by Mir, and they decide Athrin isn't being a good little guy, so they're just going to charge him with a made-up crime and arrest him. Mir warns Athrin about this, but instead of helping him escape, she just tells him to go and explain things to Durandal, then refuses to come with him. He warns her that Durandal will just kill her when he has no more use for the fake Lachis, and then he runs off into the rain. Athrin runs into Luna's sister, Marin, while escaping, and when he's almost caught, she hides him in her room. Marin ends up coming with Athrin as they make it to the hangar, and even though he tells her she should stay behind, Marin refuses. 
Well, this makes no sense, really. Mostly because Marin basically isn't a character. She has almost no lines and really sits in the background on the bridge most of the time. And Atherin even asks her why she's helping him and her answer is just, I don't know. Ray and Shin chase down the goof holding both Atherin and Marin. And after a lengthy panic attack, Shin decides that Atherin is the source of all that's wrong with the world and impales the mobile suit. He watches it fall into the ocean and then him and Ray leave. I have to say that stab attack has a pretty low kill rate, despite making the opponent's suit blow up. Durandal finds out that before Atherin left, he hacked into the Zaf database and copied a bunch of files for Operation Ragnarok, the operation where Zaft will attack the Alliance stronghold of Heaven's base. Durandal just announces the plan anyway, uh, telling the Alliance they have a short amount of time to hand over the members of Logos or their kaput. Jabril doesn't care to wait for the end of the timer, so he reveals that he has like five destroy Gundams just hanging out. He attacks the anti-Logos coalition, but now that Shin has the Destiny Gundam, they don't really stand a chance against him. The Zaft forces win the battle, but Jabril is able to escape and he heads straight to Orb to High. And also because they have a mass driver that can get him to the Alliance moon base. Atherin wakes up aboard the Archangel, and Kira explains the situation to him and Marin, before taking the Strike Rouge and going to space to see the real Lacus. Since leaving Earth, Lacus and Waldfelt have been hanging out with a faction of engineers and soldiers that are still loyal to her after the last war. When Kira arrives, Lacus gifts him with the brand new Strike Freedom Gundam, an upgraded freedom that she's been working on in her free time. Back on Earth, Shin and Rei have been made members of Faith, and the Minerva joins in the fleet headed towards Orb. The Archangel also gets word that Jabril has escaped to Orb, so they go there to do something, I guess. They don't have much of a plan. Yuna tells Durandal that Jabril isn't there and to please go away, but surprisingly that doesn't work. Yuna is such a dumbass and terrible leader that he doesn't even issue evacuation orders for his citizens. Kigali is worried about the people of Ungoro Island and wishes to use the Sky Grasper to go and rejoin her people, but that is when she is taken to a secret facility and given the Akatsuki, a big golden mobile suit that's just been hanging out underground for two years. Her dad apparently left this for her to use when the time was right, and I kind of feel like there have been plenty of times it could have been used before now. I guess no one cares about the Strike Rouge. Also, I really want to point out how confusing the editing is here. They cut directly from the bridge of the Archangel to the Hidden Hangar. So it was really confusing, and it made me think that they just had the Akatsuki aboard the ship for two years. Sometimes the flow of this show is a little weird. Kigali pilots the new suit to help defend Orb, and when Yuna hears her voice, he recognizes that she is the true leader of the country, and she immediately orders him to be arrested. A soldier even punches him in the face immediately, which is pretty funny. Shin launches from the Minerva, saying that he will be the one to crush Orb. And let me remind you that his problem with Orb is that Zaft and the Alliance fought there and stepped on his sister. It just feels a little strange that he keeps on blaming Orb for not being able to protect them, and joining Zaft as a result of that seems really strange. But then we learn that Shin is a coordinator and his parents were just living in Orb to avoid the fighting, so maybe he would have an attachment to his homeland. Either way, he's acting like a psycho. Kira shows up in the brand new Strike Freedom, and he even hand delivers a newly constructed Justice Gundam for Atherin to pilot. He saves Kigali from Shin, who is very surprised to see him alive, and the Archangel engages the Minerva. All things considered, at least the action here is pretty good, and the music is pretty hype. Yeah, they use Kira's old seed theme a little too much, but if there's any saving grace to see Destiny, it is the soundtrack. Out of nowhere, three Dom troopers land after falling from space. And I guess these guys are loyal to Lacus. I don't even remember their names, to be honest, and the Gundam wiki entry on them is like three sentences long. This one feels like a fan service moment, but you know, at least they look cool, which is kind of the feeling I get from Sea Destiny in its final arc. 
Shin returns to the Minerva after running low on power, and Kigali learns that Jibril has already fled to the moon. Then, at the end of this episode, the dumbest thing in the series happens. Neo Roanoke has been allowed to use the Skygrasper to just leave, but he decides to return to the battle and saves the Archangel, saying his famous line about making the impossible possible. This feels <laughs> so cheap, and honestly, I'm a little insulted. I called Mu Laflaga one of the more likable mentor characters, and I think that his death at the end of Seed was a really interesting and poignant end to his character arc. So that was all undone and feels bad. Also, now that they just bring Mew back after his memories come back, I feel kind of bad for Waldfelt. Ramius gets her old boyfriend back and now he just goes to hang out on the Eternal. Poor dude. Got cucked by a dead guy. Oh yeah, and at the end of the battle, Yuna gets smooshed to death by a flying goof head. That was a high point of the series. Finally, the two Lacuses, Lacusai, come to a confrontation when Kigali makes a statement on TV to rebuke Chairman Durandal's declaration of war on Logos. She's cut off by the fake Lacus spouting propaganda, causing Kira and Lacus to decide enough is enough. They take off to interrupt the interruption. The real Lacus reveals to the world that Durandal has been using a double of her, and that she does not support his words or actions. It's a little silly how everyone is able to broadcast to every TV in the world and interrupt each other in real time. The reveal of the two Lacusai causes unrest among the public. Many people are confused as Zaft truly did save them from the tyranny of the Alliance forces, but now Durandal is being painted as the true bad guy. Mir is taken into hiding, with Durandal telling her that she needs to stay out of the public eye until things calm down. This immediately makes her remember Atherin's words about being killed off screen when she no longer serves his purposes. Izak and Dirka show up and attack an Alliance force that are moving these giant tubes around in space. Of course, they're part of a super weapon called the Requiem System, which fires from a base on the moon and uses these tube-like substations to redirect the beam anywhere. It's a pretty good concept for a super weapon, honestly, though it means you have to defend a bunch of different stations throughout the Earth's orbit. Jabril fires his big super weapon and it hits the plants, causing a ton of damage, but it misses their capital. The show needs to make you hate Durandal now, so Kira and Lacus reveal that Durandal's true goal is something called the Destiny Plan. Basically, once the chairman destroys Jabril and Blue Cosmos, he won't be able to be stopped by the Alliance. He has a big space station called Messiah Station that uh, houses a bunch of servers that contain everyone's genetic code, I think? It's not very well explained. With this data, the government can just go ahead and decide what everyone is best at in life and will place you in a role based on your strengths and weaknesses. Kira points out that outliers or people that oppose the destiny plan will just be disposed of. So yeah, that sounds pretty evil. And even if this was truly a world without war, it would also be a world without freedom. Kira and Athrin decide that they have to go to space to confront Durandal. The chairman engages in a battle with the Alliance Lunar Fleet, but it really is just a cover for the Minerva to sneak close to the moon base. Shin, Rei, and Luna fight their way to the control room and destroy it, then destroy the fleeing shuttle containing Jabril. Honestly, the stakes here didn't feel very high. I mean, yeah, Jabril had a super weapon he was charging, but there was never really a sense of danger, and the trio blew up the base with very little challenge. But with Jabril being dead, and there still being six episodes in the show, we have the very tired setup for the rest of Seed Destiny. Our new cast is all shoved aside and aligned with the main bad guy, Durandal, while Kira, Athrin, and the rest of the crew of the Archangel try to stop them. There's an episode devoted to meeting up with Mir, who gets the crew into trouble when Zapped agents try to kill them, and then Mir shields Lacus from a bullet. We get Mir's whole backstory, and uh, I didn't I didn't really care at this point. Kigali gives the Akatsuki to Neo, who now has most of his memories back, and then takes her ring off and goes back to ruling Orb. The Archangel is made an official part of the Orb Space Force, and they all go up to space to have a final confrontation with the Chairman. 
Durandal unveils the Destiny Plan to the world, and the only two countries to not respond with support are Orb and the Kingdom of Scandinavia. Durandal decides in this moment that, well, the Destiny Plan isn't quite evil enough, so he fires the captured Requiem laser at Arzichel base on the moon, killing the president of the Crumbling Alliance. At least in this final arc, uh, Kira and Athrin strap meteor packs to their Gundams, which is super reminiscent of Stardust memory, so there's that. During this final battle, we see that Rey is super obsessed with Kira, maybe even more than the writers were. He reveals that he, like Rao La Crusette, is a clone. And much like his older brother, he's pretty unstable, professing himself to be the return of La Crusade himself. And Kira's like, lol, no you aren't. And then he blows him up after having a funnel fight. Athrin has a final duel with Shin, where he tells him that the Destiny Plan will not bring back his slain family, and Shin's response is just, yeah, I know, but I really want to destroy Orb, making him pretty much a lost character at this point. He doesn't even care about his own ideals anymore, being so overcome with loathing, and also being manipulated by an evil clone. Shin freaks out during their battle and almost accidentally kills Luna, but then Atherin literally kicks the Destiny Gundam so hard that Shin's entire soul leaves his body. Kira gets equipped with another meteor pack after the Archangel styles on the Minerva and causes it to crash into the moon's surface. He starts flying around the Messiah base and destroying the rings around it, letting the ships get close enough to attack. Shin then cries when he realizes that he won't be able to commit genocide today. Finally, Kira makes it inside the base and confronts Durandal at gunpoint. Durandal goes off on Kira about how he'll be just as bad as him if he resorts to murder, and to Kira's credit, he just says that he's okay with that. And if the future has more fighting because of his actions here, then he's decided he'll just continue to fight. Athrin and Talia both show up, also pointing guns, and it reminds me of that stick-up scene from The Office. Kira goes on about how being able to choose your own future is the only path forward, and just before he has to pull the trigger, a shot rings out. It is revealed that Ray had snuck into the room, and he was the one to pull the trigger on Durandal. He says that listening to Kira talk about choice and a free future is what he really wanted. Since Rey is a clone, he's always known his life would be short, and his entire life has been controlled by others since birth. He finally decides to take his fate into his own hands, and shoots Durandal of his own volition. Then the station starts to collapse, and Talia, like, invites a crazed Ray to come and sit with her, and Durandal, like, she's his mommy, and then he just goes and sits down and they all die, which I, I personally think is really stupid, seeing as how we just had a monologue about choosing your own future, but okay. The Justice and Freedom Gundams are picked up by the Archangel, and Lacus declares victory over the Zaft fleet, telling them to surrender. Orb, under the leadership of Kigali Atha, signs a truce with Lacus, who then returns to the plants. Shin and Kira finally meet face to face at the Seaside Memorial, and Kira invites Shin to join them on the Archangel. But what I do care about is the final shot of the show, showing Lacus Klein taking her place as the ruler of the plants and Zaft. When you think about it, Lacus truly is the one to make out like a bandit after all this conflict. In fact, there are many out there that believe she is the true villain of the cosmic era. Think about it, Durandal was never found to be the one behind the assassination attempt on Lacus' life, nor was he the one behind the coordinator terrorists that dropped Junius 7 on Earth. Who else has a faction of advanced military contractors with enough resources to field never-before-seen mobile suits during battle, hmm? Think about the state of the world and characters at the end of the series. Kigali and Athrin are apart and Kigali is the head of Orb and close friends with Lacus. Orb is currently the most powerful nation on Earth and allied with Zaft, so no one can really stand up against them. All the living aces from the war are on the Zaft side now, as far as we can tell, and what of Kira? For all his talk about being free and choosing his own future, he ends up as a soldier in the end. 
Now, this isn't canon in any official capacity, but at least this theory makes Gundam see Destiny a little bit more interesting. And that was a very long look at Mobile Suit Gundam Seed Destiny. A series that not only didn't live up to expectations, it made me genuinely annoyed. I think this is the first time since Victory Gundam that I wouldn't have finished a series if it weren't for the channel. And while the mobile suits are cool, they all heavily borrow from seed designs or are just ripped straight from the Universal Century. There are still issues with reused animation, even reused animation from Seed. I swear I saw the Buster Gundam's big gun animation used on a random suit somewhere in here. The story, however, truly is a giant mess. While there is something to be said about Shin being a Camille-like character that got stuck in a cycle of hatred instead of growing, that character study just wasn't done well here. As it turns out, early Zeta Camille is really annoying, so in turn Shin is a shithead for the entire run of Destiny, only to be redeemed for no reason and forgiven by Kira at the end. Combined with the knowledge that Shin's character arc was rewritten partway through Destiny's original run, along with the fact that this show had major issues in production, just like every Gundam show, it's really no surprise that he becomes a punching bag for the Gundam fandom. Not that Kira and co are any better, Kira's character arc is really weird, causing him to go against his no-kill code, and eventually come to the conclusion that killing is a requirement? Athrin spends three-fourths of the series moping about his lot in life and being a total pushover to Shin and Rei, only to end up in a much less interesting place than he was at the end of Seed. It doesn't help that the original cast is always so preachy, and there's never really a moment where they're shown consequences for any of their actions. It truly is the first time that a Gundam series feels like it was made just to capitalize on the series popularity. Thank you for watching this long video. If you've made it this far, I truly appreciate it. Next on the Gundam retrospective is going to be Gundam Double Zero. I know that there's a seed movie called Stargazer that also exists, but honestly, I just need a break from the cosmic era for a little bit. Thanks again for watching, and I will see you all soon.